Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome. Today, we honor Colonel Promotable Warren L. Wells on the occasion of his promotion to the rank of Brigadier General. The presiding officer is Lieutenant General Stuart W. Risch, the Judge Advocate General of the United States Army. My name is Major Mark Bojan, and I'm your narrator for today's ceremony. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the arrival of the official party and remain standing for the playing of the national anthem and the invocation by Chaplain Brigadier General Bill Green, Jr., Deputy Chief of Chaplains. Good afternoon. Please bow with me. Almighty God, we gather together today to pray for the soldier and leader, Colonel Warren Wells, on the occasion of his promotion and faithful service to our great nation and to our army. Your word proclaims that promotion does not come from the east, nor the west, nor the south, but it comes from you, O Lord. You have elevated him because of his disciplined life, exemplary character, commitment, and dedication to you and the manner in which he accomplishes the mission. May your guiding hand continue to lead and bless him and his wife, Mary Elizabeth. Together, they have laid a spiritual foundation of strength and stability for their home and their family. Lord, bless their children, Mark, Wren, Eli, and Whitney, and other family members and friends gathered here to celebrate with them on the occasion of his promotion to Brigadier General. Heavenly Father, may the light of liberty continue to shine bright on this great nation, on the United States Army, on the Judge Advocate General's Corps, and on Colonel Wells and his family as he assumes greater levels of responsibility. We humbly ask that you continue to guide his steps as he honors you and leads those entrusted to his care and compassion. In your most holy and blessed name I pray, people first, winning matters, army strong, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Distinguished guests, fellow service members, family and friends, good afternoon. It is my privilege to welcome you to the promotion of Colonel Warren L. Wells to Brigadier General. On behalf of Lieutenant General Risch, we extend a warm welcome to everyone gathered today, both here in person and virtually around the world, as we acknowledge and pay respect to this important milestone in Colonel Wells' Army career. At this time, we would like to introduce the Wells family, his wife, Mrs. Mary Elizabeth Wells, his son, Mr. Mark Wells, and daughter, Ms. Whitney Wells. Watching remotely are his daughter, Ms. Wren Wells, and son, Mr. Eli Wells. Also here with us today is his father, Lieutenant Colonel Retired David Wells, his mother, Mrs. Kieran Wells, his sister, Mrs. Ashley Morrow, his brothers, Mr. Matt Wells and Mr. Jason Wells, 
and his cousin, Mr. Evan Wells, along with his wife, Julie, and their children, Reed and Elizabeth. Please join me in welcoming them. We also extend a warm welcome to our distinguished visitors. Please hold your applause until the end. The presiding officer, Lieutenant General Stuart Risch and his wife, Cindy. The Honorable Caroline Crass, DOD General Counsel. The Honorable Carrie Ritchie, Army General Counsel. Lieutenant General Retired Charles Peaty, the 40th Judge Advocate General, remotely. Major General Joseph Berger, Deputy Judge Advocate General. Mr. William Kuhn, Director, Civilian Personnel, Labor and Employment Law, and Senior Civilian of the Corps. Chief Warrant Officer 5, Tammy Richmond, Chief Warrant Officer of the Corps, remotely. Command Sergeant Major, Major Michael Bostick, Regimental Command Sergeant Major. Ms. Karen Carlisle, Director, Soldier and Family Legal Services. Mr. Michael Lacey, Deputy Army General Counsel, Operations and Personnel. Brigadier General Hat Gregory Hadfield, J2, National Guard Bureau, and his wife, Catherine. Brigadier General George Smalley, Commander, U.S. Army Legal Services Agency, and Chief Judge, Army Court of Criminal Appeals. Brigadier General David Mendelson, Assistant Judge Advocate General, Military Law and Operations. Brigadier General Allison Martin, Commander, the Judge Advocate General's Legal Center and School. Brigadier General Robert Borsherding, Legal Counsel to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and his wife, Anne. Brigadier General Jackie L. Thompson, Jr., Chief Defense Counsel, Office of Military Commissions. Brigadier General Ronald Sullivan, Chief Judge, Army Court of Criminal Appeals, Individual Mobilization Augmentee. Brigadier General Michael Deegan, Assistant Judge Advocate General, Military and Law and Operations, Individual Mobilization Augmentee. Brigadier General Retired Susan Escalier, Remotely. Ms. Rebecca Osprung, Director, Civil Law and Litigation, and Mr. Carl Johnson, Senior National Security Law Attorney. Please join me in welcoming them all. Thank you all for attending. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to present the 41st Judge Advocate General of the United States Army, Lieutenant General Stuart Risch. Well, Warren, with everybody who's here for your ceremony, I wonder who's running the Pentagon right now, but that is fantastic, deservedly so. I'm glad they're here uh, to witness this, what is a fantastic occasion and a great celebration as well, too. So, so good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and again, a very warm welcome to all of you, to the Pentagon, first and foremost, and to this ceremony, a ceremony which for all of you likely seemed to have occurred somewhat swiftly but for Colonel Promotable Wells, it has been a long time in coming. And I don't mean that just in terms of Warren having known about his selection since late last summer and having had to remain completely silent about that, and you get to tell your spouse, but that's about it, until his nomination was confirmed by the U.S. Senate, which transpired only one month ago. And while I expect that no one in this audience or online will ever feel sorry for any general officer in having to go through this lengthy and at times somewhat opaque process. It is nevertheless one that requires a tremendous amount of patience while simultaneously providing ample time for calm, quiet, thoughtful reflection on all that lies ahead if one uses it correctly. And for my discussions, lengthy discussions with Warren, he's done that in spades. But I firmly believe that his selection and promotion today have been in the cards for Warren since early in his career. Again, because he is not only he is not only all of the lawyer leader, he has not only all of the lawyer leader and management talent skills and skills required to serve at the highest levels, but because he possesses certain intangibles. As others have characterized it in notes to me about today's ceremony and about Warren in general, it is a truly rare combination or blend of a calm, steady demeanor, humility, a poise and a grace that when coupled with his natural compassion and empathy makes him the ideal servant leader that we seek in our core. He is honest, a man of immense integrity and loyal to a fault. 
He is a friend to all, universally liked, admired, and respected. I honestly don't believe that I've ever heard him say, as my grandmother would say, a cross word or a negative word about another. He bridges gaps that others may not or simply can't, and he's just one of the nicest human beings that I've had the pleasure to meet in my 35 plus years in the United States Army. So Warren, I'm absolutely thrilled for you that the day has at long last come and you need wait no more to pin on. As such, I'd ask you all to join me right off the bat in a rousing ovation for the officer that we'll finally get to promote here in a few moments, Colonel Warren Wells. So I'd like to, at the outset, also take a few moments, a few housekeeping. I apologize for the delay. We started about 10 minutes late. I don't like to do that, but as fate will happen all the time, uh, number one, DVIDS was a little bit backed up and working, and we certainly want Warren's family members and the folks like uh, Lieutenant General Retired Petey and others who were online to be able to, to observe the ceremony. They couldn't make it in person, and I know they've called me uh, just like uh, General Petey called Warren this morning to express his best wishes. Uh, second, um, the caterer that was laid on by Warren and, and Mary Lease and so forth was nowhere to be found at 1400. And so we were frantically making calls. And as always happens, some of our guests who've traveled a very long distance had some difficulty getting into the Pentagon. And so we wanted to wait because I didn't want them to miss any of this ceremony. And so I take that upon myself that we, we started a little bit late. And again, before I welcome a few folks to today's ceremony, I'd like to begin by thanking all of those who made today's event such a very special occasion for Colonel Wells, for his family, and for our regiment. I know well that you've done all of the hard work up front. Now it's just up to me not to mess it all up and to bring it home. Chaplain Green, Bill, a friend of our regiment, fantastic words as always, inspirational, uplifting, and, and we know that you'd Never leave us in a pinch and you'll be here. And I know you've got a relationship with Warren as well too. So thanks for your words. To Mark, the golden voice who's been up here, much more golden than mine. I was very quick to tell him about 30 seconds into our prep yesterday that if this JAG Corps thing doesn't work out, he's got another career waiting for him afterwards. But it's working out just fine for him so far. Certain first class Humbard, where are you over there? Always, he's a presence at every single one of these ceremonies as a Sergeant First Class, ready, willing, and able to jump in and help out and, and serve any purpose that we need. Master Sergeant Purdy and the entire PPNTO team, the Pentagon Auditorium production team, our photographer with whom I'm good friends, we see each other at so many ceremonies, and so many others, really, thank you so much for everything you've done, and I'd ask you to join me in a warm round of applause for all of their work. And I know that Mark listed in a bit length, and, and amazingly, there was not one glitch on any one of those names. So a, a job extremely well done, but I'd like to extend my personal welcome and thanks for being here to folks like the Honorable Ms. Caroline Crass, the DOD General Counsel. Ma'am, I know how incredibly busy your schedule is, but I also know how intimately you've been involved in this process of getting our lead special trial counsel across the line and making this day happen. So thanks not only for being here, thank you for everything you've done to support us as well. To our good friend, the Honorable Carrie Ritchie, one of our own, a retired Army Judge Advocate, you all should know by now. Thank you again, ma'am, for all you do and for being here as well. And thanks for bringing one of your henchmen, your deputy, Mike Lacey, no stranger to our regiment as well too, Mike. It's great to see you here as well. Uh, I know that General Pyatt, the director of our Army staff, wanted to come down, has a very uh, good relationship, great relationship with Warren, but when you're the director of the Army staff, your life is not your own, and I know that he wishes that he could be here, uh, certainly. To our Leadership Foundation, our DJAG, Major General Joe Berger, Mr. Kuhn, our senior civilian, uh, to our Chief Warrant Officer of the Corps, who you heard, CW5 Tammy Richmond is online, and to our Beloved Regimental Command Sergeant Major, Command Sergeant Major Bostic, welcome to you all, and I'm glad you could all join. Along with Ms. Karen Carlisle, our SES and Director of Soldier and Family Legal Services, and Mr. Carl Johnson, who wears three hats as well. He's a DISEL, 
He's our senior national security law advisor, and he is the G2's lawyer as well. Just ask her, and she'll tell you. So great to have them here as well. Um, to our other brigadier generals, uh, I apologize not to, but we've obviously got Borcherding, we've got Mendelssohn, we've got Smalley, we've got Martin, we've got Sullivan and Thompson. Great to have you all here as well, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to recognize our newest JAG Corps general officer, but only for about 20 minutes more, <laughs> Brigadier General Mike Deegan, who was promoted about, what, three to four weeks ago. So uh, the ink isn't even dry on his rank, and he's no longer going to be the newest Brigadier General in our JAG Corps, which is fantastic. And to my beloved wife, Cindy, thanks for being here. You make everything better, for me at least, every time you're here. So thank you so much. And to all those who are joining us online, I know that we had some issues, but I think we're back up live as well, and I'm glad that you could join in as well. So please join me in a warm round of applause for all of our distinguished guests. And we saved somewhat, we could say the best for last, because we're blessed to have numerous members of Colonel Wells' family in attendance, with whom I was fortunate to share some time in my office prior to this ceremony, which is always a fantastic time to spend time with him. As you've heard, his wife, Mary Elizabeth, is here. They met on a blind date when she was in graduate school and he was in law school and have been married since August 1996. She spent her teen years in Wichita, Kansas, and later lived for a year in the Dominican Republic while serving on a church service mission. She possesses a master's degree in human development and family science from the Brigham Young University teaches in early morning, 0630 to 0720. That may not seem early to this audience, but to a bunch of high schoolers, I can tell you, that's probably not a, a fun thing to do at 0630 to 07, but a seminary class or a Bible study to the high schoolers. And she substitute teaches in special education for the Fair, Fairfax County uh, public school system. And like many spouses, she has overseen 20 PCS moves, including two overseas moves while Warren just went off, deployed somewhere, and, and left it all for her to do. So, amazing. As I am told, she is an avid pickleball player, and she challenges anyone in this room, anytime, anywhere, to a pickleball contest. Warren, you should not have thrown that in there. That was not fair to put that in. But more importantly, and more accurately, she's frequently involved in both service projects and youth activities for her children. And speaking of her children, their children, they have four wonderful kids, as you've heard, Mark 23, I say kids, 23, Wren 21, Eli 19, and Whitney 15. And as you've heard, on, unfortunately, only two could attend today's ceremony in person. Mark and Whitney are here with us, but I believe that both Wren from Idaho and Eli from Mexico are with us virtually, and we're happy to have them. Very briefly, and I know if you felt uncomfortable when your names were being read and you were introduced before, this is only going to get more uncomfortable now because I'm going to talk a little bit about you. But Mark at present is a junior at BYU majoring in facilities management and currently also find time, finds time to work uh, at a life science museum. His hobby is armored combat. A unique hobby, but hold on where participants don genuine medieval-style armor and battle with swords, axes, and maces. And just in case you were wondering, his weapon of choice is a mace. So if you see him coming, go the other way. <laughs> his group competes in competitions and performs at Renaissance festivals. Quite honestly, I was going to tell General Pyatt, an infantry officer himself, he sounds like a future recruit in our infantry branch. Whitney is a freshman at West Springfield High School who plays volleyball and will play lacrosse in the spring. However, apparently her favorite thing to do is to plan social events for her friends, and she's offered free services to anyone in the room in planning any of your social events if you'd like. And there is some inside info that I'm getting in my ear right now. She just turned 15 yesterday. So if you will join me. If you would do me the honor, do me the favor, on the count of three, with a big happy birthday. We're not going to sing. I'm not going to put you through that, but just a happy birthday to Whitney. One, two, three. Happy, happy birthday, birthday. Whitney. Woohoo! Awesome. <laughs> Gee, I've embarrassed a teenage girl. I didn't do that to my daughters at all any time, so. 
Uh, I will give you some good inside information. Your dad's getting a significant pay raise with this promotion, so your birthday gift better equaled what that is. And unfortunately unable to attend was Wren, uh, who is a junior at BYU-Idaho in Rexburg, Idaho, majoring in illustration and biology. And she loves the outdoors and loves drawing. Eli is currently a missionary in Monterey, Mexico, with 21 months remaining on his mission. When he finishes, he'll attend school, college at a school yet to be determined. I tried to get some inside information, but no schools at the top of his list or none that they were willing to share with me at this time. We're also blessed to have uh, Warren's parents here, U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel retired David and Kieran Wells, who traveled from their hometown, the family's hometown of Oxford, Mississippi. Nothing from the back row, Jim Grabert, about Oxford, Mississippi? Yeah, I bet. <laughs> so, so many of you, he needs no introduction, but Jim Garrett with his lovely wife, Kathy, kind of the group that we were holding up for, they were stuck, unfortunately. Not Kathy's fault, Jim has that record that causes it's very difficult to get into the Pentagon, but in any event. Uh, Dad's a retired Lieutenant Colonel in the Army Reserve, an MP officer. In 2012, he retired as the Senior Associate Athletics Director for Compliance and Student Services for the University of Mississippi, or Ole Miss. He devoted 37 years of his life to Ole Miss as a football player, as a coach, and administrator, finally retiring in 2012. He received his bachelor's in education and a master's of social science in history from Ole Miss, was a three-year letterman for the Ole Miss football team as a running back and wide receiver and played on the 1963 SEC championship team. In 64, he led the team in receiving touchdowns. And this is really cool, as if that wasn't. Having just watched all of the bowl games that we watched, he played in three of those bowl games for Ole Miss, including the 1964 Sugar Bowl against Alabama, where he was Ole Miss's leading receiver. You'll have to have some kind of a discussion with Miss Carlisle after this. He was Ole Miss's leading receiver in that bowl game. After a brief stint in the NFL, he served as his assistant football coach at the University of Kentucky and then at Ole Miss. In 1981, he became the director of their academic support and then transferred over to become the senior associate athletic directors for compliance and student services. And I'm gonna ask Warren at this point in time, and I'm not trying to embarrass him, to stand up, please, to turn around and face the audience because if what I just read you about Warren's father doesn't wow you enough, Colonel Wells is wearing his father's Army Service uniform jacket as a tribute to his father in this promotion ceremony today. Now, Dad, while that's a tribute to you, the fact that he can get in that uniform, I got to tell you, I can't get into my one for my first 10 or 20 years. So it's amazing that Warren's doing that, but that's great stuff. Mom, uh, Kieran is also an Ole Miss alum, and, and she and David met at the University of Mississippi. Her father, George Everett, as we talked about in my office, was a lawyer and a 22-year FBI veteran who later served for 16 years as a district attorney in Mississippi. As such, we now see where Warren's Ole Miss, Army, and lawyer or legal roots are derived. His brothers are also with us today. Matt, who's a supervisory special agent for the DEA, currently stationed in Alabama, who traveled up from Birmingham. Jason, a software consultant for Oracle, traveling from their hometown in Oxford, Mississippi. His sister Ashley's with us, a homemaker from the really cool town of Sholo, Arizona. So gotta love that. And cousin Evans uh, Wells, a banker, his wife Julie, an attorney, uh, specializing in medical law, and their son, Reed, and daughter, Elizabeth, who all also traveled from Oxford as well, too. So a very heartfelt w welcome to this wonderful family who have done so much to benefit our Army by granting Warren and Mary Elizabeth the time, space, guidance, encouragement, support, and love that enables him to do what he loves and to serve so successfully all while having demanding lives and careers of their own, as you can see. And both military service and service to others runs deep 
through this family, and for that, we owe them a debt that we simply can't repay. Yet what I can do is thank you all for sharing with us your most precious treasure in a son, a husband, a father, a brother, a cousin. And thanks for your service to our nation as well, whether as an Army spouse, Army child, Army parent, Army sibling, or in uniform yourself. We're proud of you, we appreciate you, and we recognize you now with a rousing round of applause. And now just a little bit about our man of honor before we get on to making him a general officer. I asked Warren what's important to him. And he told me, quote, my family, faith in the Lord, taking care of those in need, ball games, old movies, and being outside at the lake or on a trail. If you ask me why I like Warren Wells, I could stop right there. I asked him why he joined the army. He said, my dad insisted I fill out ROTC applications for the Army, Navy, and Air Force to help pay for college. My father did the exact same thing. I'm standing here for that reason. I had always been interested in being a lawyer and specifically working in the criminal law arena. I'm very happy about that, ma'am, that he was interested in that. So when my ROTC instructor told me about the JAG Corps, I knew that I wanted to try it. When conducting CTLT, or Cadet Troop Leader Training, in Grafenwehr, Germany, following his ROTC advance camp, his company commander put him in touch with some local judge advocates, including our very own Colonel Retired Dean Robb, now with the DA Office of General Counsel, who regaled me with glowing stories of his time in Desert Storm and with TDS and made my decision that much easier. I don't think Dino's in the audience today, are you, Dean? But I'd just like to simply say, I think we all owe Dean a great attitude for making sure that Warren came into the JAG course. So when you see him, say thanks. And if you can't already tell, Warren hails from Oxford, Mississippi. And Jim Garrett's gonna love this, along with Kathy. Founded in 1837 and named after the British city of Oxford. Home to the University of Mississippi, or Ole Miss. And also the hometown of Nobel Prize winning novelist, William Faulkner. On my visit, when I went to Jim and Kathy's uh, daughter's wedding a few years back, I had to walk the town square, known as the square, eat a piece of pizza at Square Pizza, and shop at Square Books. And I bought a Faulkner book while I was there. I found it interesting, though, that now Warren claims Faulkner as a classmate during his time at Ole Miss, and that he wrote most of Faulkner's essays and term papers for him. <laughs> But a little research shows that Faulkner actually passed away in 62 at the age of 64, so that claim may not be altogether accurate. Author John Grissom, an attorney, Mississippi politician, acclaimed novelist of 47 number one best-selling legal fiction books, many of which became movie box office hits. Did you write any of those for him? No. Lived in Oxford years for years, but now calls where? Charlottesville which just so happens to be our, where our regimental home sits on the UVA campus. And for me, the six degrees of Warren Wells simply never ending, apparently. No surprise, his civilian education includes the University of Mississippi, graduated in 1993, cum laude, and was commissioned uh, upon graduation, but was granted an educational delay to attend law school, where he attended law school at Brigham Young, graduating in 1996, again graduating cum laude and Order of the Coif as well, an honor society for law students. After graduation from law school, Warren entered our Army JAG Corps and attended OBC in 96. Thus began a truly stellar legal and Army career, which, again, over the past 26 years has swiftly, steadily, and surely led him to this very day. A day that comes as no surprise to anyone who knows him, who has worked with him, or who has been fortunate enough to have been led and or mentored, advised, educated, trained, coached, or cared for by him in any form or fashion. For those who may not be aware, since the passage of last year's uh, National Defense Authorization Act, the services were required to each develop an office of the Special Trial Council, whose congressional mandate is to provide expert, 
specialized, independent, and ethical representation of the United States in the investigation and trial-level prosecution of 11 specific covered offenses under the UCMJ. One lead special trial counsel in the rank of Brigadier General is statutorily responsible for supervising this organization. The education, training, resourcing, and functioning of its team of military justice experts. As I've indicated previously, the lead special trial counsel position, given the nature of its duties, demands not only a lawyer with an extensive military justice background, but also a proven organizational leader with the skill to establish priorities and goals, advocate effectively for required personnel and resources, serve as a principal legal advisor at the strategic level, that is to report directly to the Secretary of the Army and coordinate with countless other stakeholders at the OSD and HQDA level. And finally, to communicate effectively on behalf of the OSTC with exceptional clarity, precision, energy, and resolve. And to put it simply, Warren Wells is uniquely, superbly, and perfectly qualified for this position. His military justice experience is both considerable and balanced, having served in multiple positions on both the prosecution and defense sides of the bar. Early on in his career, he served as a trial counsel, what we call a prosecutor, for a unit in Baumholder, Germany, routinely prosecuting a wide range of offenses to include multiple sex assaults. He was then assigned as the senior defense counsel at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, leading a team that defended soldiers at countless courts martial and adverse administrative hearings. Based on his recognized military justice expertise, and I think this is really cool, Colonel Wells then joined the faculty at the Air Force JAG School down in Alabama. And in 2004, or, or in 2004, where he taught military criminal law and was subsequently selected by Air Force JAG Corps leadership to become the first Army instructor to serve as a chief of their criminal law department at their own JAG school. He subsequently served as a regional defense counsel for the Great Plains region, where he supervised 20 defense counsel at five field offices who defended active duty and reserve component soldiers in a 13 state region, facing criminal prosecution and or adverse administrative action. Over the course of his career, he has either litigated or provided direct oversight over scores of criminal cases. But in addition to his vast experience in military justice, he has a proven record of success as a collaborative, thoughtful, and driven organizational leader. He served as the chief of our personnel plans and training office and was thus responsible for strategic talent and force management for all components of our Corps. He served as the staff judge advocate or senior lawyer for the 1st Infantry Division in Fort Riley and then the 18th Airborne Corps and Fort Bragg, where he provided principal legal advice to the commanding general and staff and supervised the provision of a full range of legal services, including an extremely robust criminal law practice and the referral, exactly what he'll be doing now, of hundreds of cases at two of our Army's, Army's largest and busiest units and installations. He also previously served as the chief of our plans, a section overseeing our force management budget and strategic planning and personnel policies. In short, there is no area of the OSTIC's procedure, policies, and or practice in which Warren has not been intimately involved at some point in his truly impressive and wide-ranging assignment history. But now, that's my take on Warren Wells. Yet you need not rely solely on my word, but instead very briefly hear from what others have had to say about this officer. Throughout his extraordinary career, Warren has worked for a list of commanding generals and leaders that reads like a who's who within our Army. From then Major General Mark Hurtling, uh, who served as, who later served as a three-star in the USER and 7th Army Commander in Germany, and is now, you probably see him routinely on CNN as a uh, military expert uh, advising them, talking with them, and subsequently worked for another two-star general, Terry Wolf, who later served as deputy special presidential envoy for the global coalition to counter the jihadist militant group ISIL. And each of these senior leaders indicated that Warren was so effective as a leader lawyer that the Army must promote him and assign him well ahead of his peers. 
in his time as the Regional Defense Counsel, then Brigadier General Flora Darpino, that everyone knows became our TJAG, where she characterized him as the best of the 27 lieutenant colonels she had working for her and her top choice for promotion to colonel. In his time as the 1ID, Big Red 1SJ, with then Brigadier General Pat Frank, now the three-star Art Sent Commander, and then Major General Joe Martin, who later rose to serve as our four-star Army Vice Chief of Staff. Both of these commanders advocated for his immediate selection as a Brigadier General and service at the top of our regiment. And finally, in his time as the 18th Airborne Corps SJ, he advised both then Lieutenant General La Camera, who now serves as the four-star commander of all of our forces in Korea, and then Lieutenant General Carrilla, who currently serves as the CENTCOM commander as a four-star, where he was ranked in the top four of 50 colonels of all branches within the command and as an absolute must-select for Brigadier General. General Berger and I have also supervised Warren and provided him with multiple evaluations and have alternately viewed him as the best of 26 lieutenant colonels and or the top two of 35 plus colonels. And as Major General Berger so aptly stated in his last evaluations, Warren's dedication to his people and craft, fueled by unrivaled potential, make him a must for Brigadier General and assignment to this critical new billet. Now I received countless additional notes and email with wonderful comments and stories singing Warren's praises, but obviously too much for today's ceremony as I've already exceeded my time limit. But it is just so easy to get lost when speaking in glowing terms about Warren. But if you'll indulge me, there are two final humorous stories about Warren, and then we'll make him a general officer. The first of which comes from Brigadier General Dave Mendelson. Can I stop right there? Do you need to hear any more? A good friend and graduate course classmate of Colonel Wells. Then Colonel Mendelson was the passenger in a car driven by Colonel Wells during the SJA course in Charlottesville when the song, quote, You Should Be Dancing by the 1970s and 1980s era disco group, the Bee Gees, came on. Now, Cindy reminded me I probably need to explain to some in the audience that's B-E-E, -E, new word, G-E-E-S, the Bee Gees. Hopefully you've heard of them. Colonel Wells was trying to focus on driving and navigating while then Colonel Mendelssohn was busy singing along and dancing in his seat with the usual Mendelssohn-esque gyrations, arm waving, and just a general good vibe feel. Eventually, Dave asked Colonel Wells, Warren, can you name the three Bee Gees? He expected Colonel Wells to at least to be able to name one of the three brothers, Barry, Robin, or Maurice but was absolutely flabbergasted when Colonel Wells responded with, of course I can, Dave, Rish, Petey, and Wilson. <laughs> now, Warren, you may not know the three members of the music group, the Bee Gees, but you'll very shortly become the JAG Corps' sixth active duty Bee Gee. And you may not get the reference to their songs, but we all know that Mendelssohn was only staying alive and telling that story. He was likely suffering from a night fever, and we consider him retelling that story an absolute tragedy. But... <laughs> and from a dear friend and cherished colleague in the back, Colonel, Jim, uh, Colonel retired Jim Garrett, he says, I'm not sure when I met Warren. I think it was while he was in the basic course. But when you're from Mississippi, you just know each other. We stayed in touch through the years, and at PPNTO, when we needed someone to clean up after a guy named Mendelssohn, Warren was the only person for the job. As the cap captain's assignments officer, Warren singularly was singularly responsible for an end strength of over 1,000 captains. He was simply amazing at complex problem solving that at times involved forecasting third, fourth, and fifth order consequences. Warren was so adept at balancing the needs of SJAs and the Army with the individual captain's needs and wishes that we never got a complaining call from any SJA, not one. And Jim then goes on to relate a humus, humorous story involving Warren and again, Brigadier General Mendelssohn, who were very close and longstanding friends, obviously. I don't know why, Warren, but... Uh, <laughs> but he confirms that their friendship almost ended during their grad course time, and it was all due to their shared ultra-competitive natures. Jim indicates that, quote, back in the day, competitive sports between the JAG school faculty 
and grad course in OBC, officer basic courses, were heated affairs. And he puts in parentheses, just ask TJAC. I have no idea what he's talking about. None. During Warren's grad course, we developed a round robin schedule that involved the grad course and faculty each playing the OBCs during the year. Ultimately, the faculty and the grad course, both undefeated, met on the flag football field for the championship of our core. Curiously, the grad course chose not to have just one head coach. Instead, Warren channeled his days terrorizing opponents at Bobby Holcomb Field for the Oxford Chargers and was their defensive coordinator. Dave Mendelson channeled his days in a unitard for the Utica Blue Bombers <laughs> and was their offensive coordinator. The two were seen at halftime of a very tight game with the faculty engaged in an emotional discussion <laughs> punctuated with very un-Mendelson like animation and gesticulation. I'm certain that no one in here has ever witnessed Dave do that before. With less than a minute 30 to go in the game, the faculty was leading, but a touchdown would seal the championship for the grad course. The grad course offense had first and goal from the faculty's two yard line. But after much dispute between the coaches, they ran the ball on four straight plays. And Jim asked the question, who does that in flag football? And were stopped cold each time and ultimately hung their heads in defeat. Both Warren and Dave learned a valuable lesson about the unity of command the hard way that day, Jim says. And I'll add by saying that there was no joy in Mudville that day. The mighty Casey's had struck out. And if I'm not mistaken, Warren still talks about that game to this day, and according to sources, can break it down for you play by play. <laughs> but he's not competitive at all. And Warren, with all of that, humorous and otherwise, is a backdrop to what is about to transpire. Let me tell you that I expect nothing but the same sustained, continued excellence from you moving forward. We always say that promotion is more about future potential than it is about past performance but we've had both prominently demonstrated by you throughout your career. So Cindy and I wish you and Mary Elizabeth and the whole family the very best in everything that awaits. Knowing you, I am certain that you'll enjoy every minute of it. But I charge you now to continue to do those things that you've always done. Take care of your people, look after your family, and mind your own personal well-being well -being too. I can tell that you will. And now I'd ask you all to help me congratulate for the last time Colonel Promotable Warren Wells before we promote him to Brigadier General. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated. Attention to orders. The President of the United States has reposed special trust and confidence in the patriotism, valor, fidelity, and abilities of Warren L. Wells. In view of these qualities and his demonstrated potential for increased responsibility, he is therefore promoted in the United States Army to the rank of Brigadier General, effective 3 December 2022, by order of the Secretary of the Army. Brigadier General Warren Wells. Lieutenant General Risch will now present Brigadier General Wells with his certificate of promotion. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated. 
Lieutenant, Lieutenant General Risch will now administer the oath of office. Raise your right hand and repeat after me. I state your full name. I, Warren L. Wells. Having been appointed an officer. Having been appointed an officer. In the Army of the United States. In the Army of the United States. In the rank of Brigadier General. In the rank of Brigadier General. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend. That I will support and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. Against all enemies. Against all enemies. Foreign and domestic. Foreign and domestic. And that I will bear true faith. And that I will bear true faith. And allegiance to the same. And allegiance to the same. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation. Without any mental reservation. Or purpose of evasion. Or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully. And that I will well and faithfully. Discharge the duties. Discharge the duties. Of the office. Of the office. Upon which I'm about to enter. Upon which I'm about to enter. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Ladies and gentlemen, Brigadier General Wells will now uncase his personal flag. The history of the general officer flag dates to 1887, when the Secretary of War authorized officers of the Corps of Engineers to carry on boats a square scarlet flag with a white castle in the center. The current design, a scarlet flag with white star and gold fringe, was authorized in 1947. The flag marks the personal presence of a general officer. Whether flown above a military installation or displayed indoors, it indicates the rank of the officer by the number of white stars on the distinctive red background. Master Sergeant Shamar Purdy and Sergeant First Class Chance Humbard will bring forward the flag. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Brigadier General Warren L. Wells. Thank you very much. Um, sir, Cindy, thank you very much for, for doing that. Ms. Crass, Ms. Ritchie, General Berger, Sergeant Major, Ms. Kuhn, Ms. Carlisle, Chaplain Green, I, I want to stop there and just thank Chaplain Green. We were deployed together in 1st Armored Division. I learned a great leadership uh, lesson. Not only uh, did he minister the troops there, but related, if you'll allow me to share just briefly, a great leadership lesson I learned. Um, on a previous deployment, they approached the unit 1st uh, Armored Division, a prior deployment with 1st Armored Division, reached the year mark, and the unit had infiltrate or ex filled out of uh, Iraq and were were at the airport loaded bags stowed people excited knowing that in Germany their family was gathering in a gym to uh, to return home to and they got the word that that uh, the leadership had extended those deployments to 15 months as part of the surge and that they were to deboard the plane and come back and return to a very hostile area. Um, and the commander got on the, on the intercom of the plane and made that announcement. And Chaplain Green shared how he immediately, at that time, began thinking, how do I take care of not only the troops 
who are returning to harm's way, but also the commander who had to make that announcement um, and face that, you know, those, those issues himself. And what he didn't say was Chaplain Green and his family was waiting in that gym. And uh, his first thoughts were turned to the soldiers and the commander that he was assigned to. And what a great leadership lesson that was. I've always remembered that, that, uh, that it was that selfless service. So I appreciate you being here as well. Um, and my fellow one star, Mr. Lacey, my fellow one stars who are here, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for my family, so many longtime friends and colleagues who are here, uh, and I know watching as well. Um, I am very humble, very grateful for this opportunity um, to, uh, to lead the Office of Special Trial Counsel. Um, General Risch, thank you very much again for, uh, for your kind words. Uh, nothing that uh, Jim Garrett said about that game was, was true. <laughs> Sadly, the final score was, but, uh, um, but we had better stats, if I remember right. We, <laughs> a lot of yards gained. Um, the, uh, I, I want to publicly thank also my Heavenly Father, who, uh, who has blessed this great nation and my family and each of us here, uh, I am I'm thankful for um, the opportunity to have, have served and the blessings um, that have, uh, I'm not particularly deserving of, but, uh, but grateful for nonetheless. This event took a huge support team. Um, I, I will say this, uh, there's, a, there's a great man named Dieter Uchtdorf who one time uh, gave an analogy of somebody trying to move a piano and they realized that piano is much too heavy for me. And so they grabbed some of their friends and everybody got around the piano and when they lifted, they said, wow, uh, this piano is not so heavy after all um, because it was the people around the piano with and, and they're the team here who helped. So Colonel Steve Ranieri, Lieutenant Colonel Max Maxwell, uh, Majors Mark Bojan, who did the, uh, the narration, Chris Wittenberger, Gavin Grimm, uh, Chet Hutchinson, uh, CW3 Gio Suarez, CW3 Hector Cologne, um, Sergeant Major Joe Bannon, uh, Mass Sergeant Shamar Purdy, part of the flag detail, um, Sergeant First Class Chance Humbard as well, Staff Sergeant Sarah Barron, and of course, with everything, uh, the incomparable XO, Colonel Terry Arisman, uh, thank you for surrounding this piano and helping today. Um, our family recently over the holidays went down to Stanton, Virginia and watched an, uh, a, a Christmas carol there at the Shakespeare Theater. It was fantastic. Um, we really enjoyed it. I love each year in the Christmas carol, uh, specifically how in the story Dickens writes, he talks about the ghosts of Christmas past, present, and future. And through that talks a little bit about Scrooge's things to be grateful for, areas of regret, but most importantly, the opportunity. I wanna address those three ghost-like topics today. Um, and that is the past, the present, and the future. Um, I don't know how much I wanna get into regret. I think everybody has some of those, but I certainly have much to be grateful for and I'm excited about opportunities uh, moving forward. Um, General Risch talked a little bit about, uh, about my parents uh, for whom I'm grateful um, and mentioned one of my grandfathers who's in the FBI uh, here in DC for a bit uh, and then in other places uh, throughout the world and then uh, spent 16 years as a district attorney. I can remember as a young man uh, hearing him talk about uh, going before the grand jury um, accompanying up to the courthouse uh, one time uh, where apparently I strayed too near uh, someone in shackles um, and they move, move around over here a little bit, uh, but a, a great influence. My other grandfather was a radio man and he uh, had a special gift for news and stories. And uh, those two things, being able to tell important stories in a way that connects with people and the love of the law, and especially justice in criminal law. Um, 
my cousin Evans, his dad is an attorney who, uh, when he started, it does, a, does a wide variety in his practice, but loves to do criminal law and started as a public defender uh, with the public defender co uh, contract in, in his hometown and used to regale me of stories of, of criminal law and defending clients and people in need. Um, those things crystallized in my mind and, uh, and indeed, just as General Rich said, I wanted to be a lawyer. I wanted to tell those stories and provide justice and due process, both on the prosecution and the defense, uh, and, and what was owed to society. Uh, my dad, General Rich mentioned this uniform, uh, the jacket he's wearing, um, that I'm wearing was, was my dad's. Um, I watched him for years, not only uh, serve at the university, but also on the weekends uh, and throughout his time in the reserve, uh, serve his nation as well. Um, and uh, one of the, the lessons he told me that I remember very well is we would finish, uh, my brothers and I can and attest, and my sister Ashley too, uh, we didn't always do things the easy way, right? Um, Every weekend there was some project to be done, whether it was a load of lum uh, lumber, I'll give you a penny for every nail you pull out of this used lumber, so we out there in the hot sun pulling nails, getting uh, not rich, or, uh, <laughs> or the year that I got a job at Baskin Robbins um, and was told I can get you a better job uh, cleaning the clubhouse and picking up uh, uh, mowing at the, at the golf course for less than minimum wage and that's a better job because you'll be outside and you'll, you won't be soft inside the ice cream parlor uh, where it's a, uh, air conditioned. Again, did not get rich, um, but learned some things. But at the end of the day, whenever we would work outside, uh, I'd be ready to put the tools away, throw them in the shed, and head inside for a little AC and, and something on TV. And uh, he would say, nope, we've got to put them in the right place. We've got to clean every tool. He said, if you take care of your equipment, your equipment will take care of you. I thought that was a great lesson that in the JAG Corps, in the Army, you know, we have a lot of equipment, but our most important equipment are the people. And so I, I don't know that I've been fully successful in that, but Dad, thank you very much for, for that advice. And I think that is true where you've seen um, people take care of, of people. Uh, the people take care of you. And that's certainly been the case for me. Um, any great tra any traveler who successfully gets somewhere uh, travels over bridges that other people built. In, in my case, it's probably a causeway. But uh, throughout my career, I've had great mentors. Um, many of them are here. Um, Jim Garrett being one, did meet in the basic course. Jeff Nance, uh, Judge Nance is another, who's uh, on a cruise right now. But uh, but uh, also met in the basic course and were fantastic mentors. Um, Kevin Jacobson, my first deployment in Bosnia, was a great mentor. Uh, Steve Haight, who is here, uh, met in Bosnia. We transitioned uh, in Bosnia on a deployment in a small base camp. Uh, there have been many throughout my time who have been mentors. And, and even many of my peers, I've got a number of grad course classmates uh, here in, in the audience. Um, Lance Hamilton, um, I've got uh, Dee Fleming, I see here, uh, have, been, uh, have been super, super examples and uh, battle buddies throughout my time. Speaking of battle buddy, um, I've also, uh, I, don't, I don't see him, but uh, my battle buddy, Ron, G Brigadier General Ron Sullivan, uh, and I were battle buddies in the basic course years ago at Fort Lee. Um, so my family, my brothers and sisters, we lived uh, in the back. We backed up to the Holly Springs National Forest, and we were always playing army in the woods. And so um, I've just never stopped. Uh, they've gone on to other things. <laughs> Still seem to be playing army in the woods. Um, the past has certainly been prelude to the present, and so the present. Um, for, to the team at PPTO, uh, where I was just there. Um, thank you, what a fantastic team. 
Uh, my first time in PPTO, I remember getting called in and asked, uh, it may have been Colonel Garrett saying, uh, tell me about this one colonel. And I wanted to, he said, thinking of sending this colonel to a particular shop, and I thought he'd ask, does he write well? Can he think through the legal issues? Instead, the question was, does he take care of captains? And so that was, a, that was a, an epiphany to me that PPTO, for as many rumors out there of, uh, of Ouija boards and other uh, dart boards for assignments, that uh, the, the care and concern of the team and PPTO through the years, and especially right now, um, really focused on taking care of people. Marvin, I know you're going to do a fantastic job as the new chief, so well done. Um, my... The, the great officers and NCOs worked with at the Great Plains region in trial defense service, a, a, an organization that we'll be working with, but near and dear to my heart, Sean, now at the head of that great organization, um, and, uh, and the folks that worked with me there were outstanding litigators who essentially stood in the breach and protected the rights of accused. Um, my time with 1st Infantry Division, 1st Armored Division, and 18th Airborne Corps, again, uh, each one of those, um, my success, a direct reflection on the, on the lieutenants, captains, majors, lieutenant colonels, and the, uh, the NCO Corps that, uh, that was there at those organizations. Um, <clears throat> but there's also another team that, to me, is the most important team. Um, it was... Uh, there's a former president, Ronald Reagan, who said, all great change in America begins at the dinner table. Um, I, think that's, uh, I think that's true. And for me, great change and great support begins at the dinner table at home. And so um, five deployments, 20 moves, numerous field problems, TDYs, time preparing for court, time preparing uh, evaluations, time responding uh, to issues to provide advice. Uh, thank you. So um, I have a couple of things, I think, uh, that I want to share with my family. So my wife, Mary Elizabeth, thank you very much for everything. I love you. <laughs> My son, Mark, three different high schools, lettered in three different schools. I, I guess that means a lot of jackets, but, uh, <laughs> but I tell you, you know, military kids are supportive. And you notice this bag, hey, it's got happy birthday. Yesterday at Whitney's birthday, there was a lot of time prepping and uh, a bit shortchanged, but thank you, thank you for all you do. And you get to stay in the same high school for a little while. <laughs> it's a good thing. So, yep, for my, I think this is uh, for my dad. Thank you so much, a little something. Let's go ahead and bring a couple of them. Let's grab, I'm gonna move along. Great. All right, to my mom who taught me to listen with compassion. Um, and my sister, Ashley. And for Matt, you and your family. Jason, you and your family. Just a little something to remember your time at the Pentagon. <laughs> and Evans, for you and your family. Thank you for making the trip. Um, I've got uh, so many friends as well who, uh, from, from past, uh, speaking of past, who have been a support and made the trip out here, some of them from quite a distance. Uh, Dr. Paul and Catherine Moore from Nashville uh, came, have, have been a way station as we've gone back and forth in PCSs across the country. We can always stop at Nashville where Paul works there at Vanderbilt and, uh, and a, a comforting way station. Uh, Mr. Mike and Sherry Brown um, and uh, Margaret Lindsay and Christopher, their families were, 
were uh, refuges for me when, uh, when I was in law school and have provided friendship for many, many years. Thank you for, for making the trip. Um, so many others, I, I look out, I see uh, the Pochets in bomb holder years ago, uh, Tim uh, Hayes, who's uh, now the chief judge of, of uh, ACA. Um, we opened our, our doors at, uh, at uh, it was uh, cast cubed years ago at Fort Leavenworth in the great labyrinth that is Hogue Barracks out there, um, expecting to see a minotaur perhaps roaming the hallways and instead, uh, we found that we were one another roommates for those five weeks of training, and we were both judge advocates. And uh, thank you for being here. Um, talked a little bit about the past, talked about the present. I want to talk a little bit about the future. Um, it was our first president, commander in chief, it was George Washington, who said that. Uh, Discipline is the soul of an army. Um, but he followed that up. He said, nothing can be more hurtful to the service than the neglect of discipline. Um, so, as we know, the Office of Special Trial Counsel created by Congress to handle certain offenses. Um, as there's been um, introspection nationally, on types of offenses, and we are, uh, we're at a, a point where uh, Congress has directed an independent look at those investigations and making decisions on taking them to trial. I'm grateful for this opportunity. Um, discipline is the soul of an army, and its neglect does affect, um, is hurtful to the service. Uh, but here's something I know. I know that the judge advocates who are out there now and the uh, judge advocates who have been there in the past have faithfully executed their duties on behalf of victims, crime victims, and others uh, to ensure that their communities are safe. They have, um, as we put together the team for the OSTIC, we found that we have a lot of people with great experience. We knew that because we were tracking that. And we are putting fantastic people in there throughout the, the world. But, but the work they do will be the same level of dedication and professionalism that we have, that judge advocates have provided for years. Um, what's different? Well, our first Chief Justice, John Marshall, said, what is it that makes us trust our judges, their independence in office? And so this is an opportunity where judge advocates will professionally uh, look at cases and make independent decisions on whether to refer those to trial. And they will continue to faithfully prosecute those uh, crimes. Um, here is one thing that I will, will say moving forward, uh, and that is to uh, independently and in the best interests of the community, which means society at large, the military community, the civilian society outside, families, victims, and even the accused under due process will provide discipline and caring, trained uh, attorneys to make independent decisions and to observe due process uh, throughout uh, the entire legal proceedings for those who are accused of, of crimes. No one can promise perfection. Um, there will always be critics. But what I do know is that we have dedicated professionals who will continue to do their best to take care of people and to listen and to do the right thing. Sir, thank you very much again. Thank you all for coming out. Uh, I really appreciate the support. Uh, I am excited to work with the Office of Special Trial Counsel. There are already dedicated, uh, high-performing people who are there uh, getting things set up. And uh, I am grateful for each of you and what you have meant to me throughout my life. Uh, and uh, thank you very much.
Ladies and gentlemen, please remain standing for the playing of the Army song. The words are printed in your program. March along, sing our song with the army of the free. Count the brave, count the true who have fought to victory. We're the army and proud of our name. We're the army and proudly proclaim first to fight for the right and to build the nation's might and the army goes rolling along proud of all we have done fighting till the battle's won and the army goes rolling along and it's high high hey the army's on its way count out the cadence loud and strong for wherever we go you will always know that the army goes rolling along. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's ceremony. Please join us at the front of the stage to congratulate Brigadier General Wells and his family, followed immediately by a reception in the hall directly outside the auditorium. Thank you. <laughs>